Welcome to this Wisconsin Council of Churches webinar. You are here for an evening with Diana Butler Bass and Brian McLaren, two good friends of the council. They have joined us on Washington Island in the past for the Washington Island Forum. And we are delighted to have a chance for a conversation about religion and politics in the election and hope and whatever else comes up because in addition to being friends of the council, they are good friends of each other. Diana is an award-winning author, popular speaker, inspiring preacher, and a trusted commentator on religion and contemporary spirituality. I'm not gonna list her books because there is a good number of them. I will trust you to find her website to go through that list. She does have a newsletter titled The Cottage, and that's published on Substack. She also has a book titled Freeing Jesus coming out next March, so keep your eyes out for that. Brian also writes a great deal. Same thing, I cannot list all of his books and publications. Go to his website, find them, they're worth reading. Author, speaker, activist, public theologian, former teacher, current teacher, really, pastor, a passionate advocate. He has some new releases coming up, the very next one being Faith After Doubt in January. You want to keep your eyes out for that. And he blogs, and Diana says she's a big fan of his blogging right now, so don't miss it. And with that, I think I'm going to let them take over the hour because they have an awful lot to share with us. They have some things to say. They'll chat. Start bookmarking your questions and send them my way using the chat or using the question and answer function. And we'll have some time towards the end of the hour to take a few questions. With that, Diana, I believe you are on. Thank you, Carrie. Um, when Brian and I were on the phone this afternoon, we were trying to think about what would be helpful in relationship to having a conversation that would encourage you and give you a, a sense of hope uh, in what is admittedly an incredibly uh, difficult time. I had said to, to Brian when I was talking to him that I had trouble sleeping last night. There was just so much um, on my mind. And so one of the things that I've been doing over the last week as the news has gotten a lot worse and harder to watch, I found it very difficult to watch. I found it increasingly difficult um, to be on social media. I've just been looking for things that um, are unexpected or that sort of turn my imagination towards um, a sense of optimism. And so, so I wanted to share with you some numbers. Those of you who know me know how difficult it is for me to ever give a lecture without some sort of chart. <laughs> and I'm not going to put a chart up today, but I want to tell you about a chart that actually meant a lot to me this week. Um, at the beginning of the week, I was on a conversation, another uh, web webinar with a, a different friend of someone that both Brian and I know, uh, Dr. Uh, Robbie Jones of Public Religion uh, Research Institute. And um, Robbie and I were talking about religion and politics, and we were focusing very closely around issues of white supremacy. And, and I made uh, some comment about the decline of evangelicalism in the United States, especially since 2016 and the last election. And this is something I've talked about for, for a number of years on the road. And I was laughing because I, I was reminiscing with Robbie about how people oftentimes didn't believe me when I said that uh, white evangelicalism was really struggling with numbers and that the decline in that part of the American religious uh, family uh, was uh, quite severe. And Robbie just popped right out and he said, well, you know, I have a survey coming out next week and I have the, the latest numbers on um, religious adherence. And I said, I said, you do? And he said, yes. And he said, you are exactly right. Um, the white evangelical 
portion of the American population has declined significantly over the last decade. And then he gave the numbers in 2008, a bit more than 21%, almost 21.5% of all Americans of the American population were white people who were evangelicals. And then he went on and he said, today, that number stands at 15% of the population. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I mean, that is a significant uh, point percentage decline. And then he laughed and he, he kind of said, and the really weird thing is that it's the exact same percentage of the population who are now white mainline Protestants. And that was the piece that, that threw me for a loop because I, I hadn't seen the latest statistics on white mainline churches. Um, actually, what I had seen in recent days were the parochial reports of my own Episcopal church, which were um, not very good in terms of membership and attendance and some other things. And so a lot of Episcopalians on social media had been complaining about this. But the whole family of uh, white mainline denominations has actually in the last four years uh, shown a bit of an increase. There's been a small uptick. So in that, that same period of time, that same decade, when the white evangelical percentage of the population went from a little bit more than 21% of all Americans to 15%, uh, what's happened with the white mainline is that it has gone from 17% in 2008, going to a low of almost 12% in uh, 2000, I believe it was 15, and now has edged uh, back up uh, to 15% uh, of the population. Now, this number uh, is surprising to me for any number of different reasons. And um, one of them is something I haven't told anybody, but I guess I'm telling all of you right now, is that the book that I'm going to write next after the book comes out in March is I'm actually working on a history of Protestantism that includes both fundamentalism and liberalism. And there are very few histories of American Protestantism that look at both of those families. And so the thing that just kind of threw me for a loop was here we are 100 years out uh, from the uh, fundamentalist modernist crisis of the 1920s, the Scopes Monkey Trial, the founding of Westminster Theological Seminary, the big fights around Princeton, all of these things that happened in the 1920s. And what has happened is that American Protestantism has gone through a precipitous decline but now these two great families, the liberals and the conservatives, who have been at, at basically fighting each other now for, for all these decades, are essentially tied uh, in the proportion of the population. And so a, a, a century of fighting and the whole Protestant family has slipped down in terms of its adherence throughout the population. Uh, but each one of those groups, the liberals and the conservatives, who are the heirs of that fight a hundred years ago, it's essentially a wash. And um, that is not how the story is usually told in the media. The story is usually told in the media that evangelicals won and that their churches are growing and that the main line is declining. But that's not the story. The story is both of these traditions um, are, the, are essentially the same size in terms of the population. And uh, what Robbie went on to say, and I th think that he was correct in our conversation in that other uh, webinar, is he said, I think what, this, what these charts show, and the, the whole set of charts will be out on this next Monday. Um, he said, what I think this set of charts show is that some time about 10 or 15 years ago, the main line found its bottom. And that this is, and that you're in the process as mainline Protestants of adjusting to what the new reality is. And then he went on and he mentioned to the host um, of this uh, podcast we were on that he, he, he was not convinced that white evangelicalism had yet found 
its numerical bottom. He said that the trends were too rapid and that he suspected that the percentage of white evangelicalism would go down. Now, um, in relationship to what we are going to be talking about here tonight, um, I went and I looked up the Wisconsin numbers in particular. And one of the things that's really interesting about Wisconsin is that you are a state with one of the highest populations of white mainline Protestants. As a matter of fact, there's only one religious group in Wisconsin that's bigger than white mainline Protestants, and that is white people who are non-religious. And so I was sort of surprised that your numbers are higher um, than those national numbers. Which means, of course, that you are in a really interesting place um, in terms of your churches. You're in a really interesting place in terms of some national arguments. And you're probably um, in an interesting place thinking about your relationship with, uh, with uh, communities of color and also with uh, your evangelical neighbors. But, but fascinatingly enough, you still have um, the, the largest single group um, of religious adherents of all of the different religious families. So, so tonight is a, a little bit about religion and politics and uh, putting those mainline numbers in perspective, I just wanna do that and then turning over to Brian, is in uh, 2016, in the Clinton-Trump election, um, white mainline Protestants um, voted for Hillary Clinton. The number that uh, was the final number was 39% of white mainline Protestants uh, voted for Hillary Clinton, and 58% voted for Donald Trump. With the rest of those people voting for third-party candidates. And today, um, actually, in the last uh, I think it was 18 hours or so, um, Pew which is another wonderful polling organization, um, released its uh, polling data pre-election on where these uh, different religious groups stand right now as votes are being cast. And the number of, for white mainliners, it appears um, at this point is on a national level, uh, white mainliners have made a slight swing um, towards Joe Biden and are voting around 44% for Biden. So that's a five point or so um, swing. And that their percentage of votes for Donald Trump has dropped from 58% to 53%. And there was, I think 4% were undecided. Uh, the evangelical numbers have stayed the same. Um, is that evangelicals nationally voted 16% for Hillary Clinton and 81% for Donald Trump, and right now are leaning towards voting 17% for Biden and 78% um, for, for Donald Trump. So what this number, set of numbers tells me when I'm on a call sponsored by the Wisconsin Council of Churches, which is largely, of course, a organization that comes out of the mainline traditions and that has widened its breadth now to, of course, include uh, lots of ethnic churches and other traditions as well. But what, what this means, of course, is that those of you who are in that historic mainline are in denominations that are almost nearly evenly divided politically. And um, I was on a phone call with a church in uh, Michigan just a couple of days ago as well. And that church was actually divided internally uh, the pastor there told me that 50% of the people in his congregation were voting for um, Joe Biden and 50% for Donald Trump. So I guess all that's to say if, is things are really changing. And if you feel exhausted and you're worried about division, I want you to know you're not alone. And it's not just an, sort of an illusion or it's not your problem all of the things that you are feeling right now as a church goer or as a church leader are actually reflected in what I can see in front of me, I've got this little piece of paper in front of me, probably one of the most interesting and yet difficult sets of numbers that I've ever seen um, in advance of an election. And so that's one of the reasons why I was looking forward to being with you tonight is because I know it is really hard out there and that you need friends. And uh, one of the friends I depend on most to cheer me up uh, when I can't see clearly is the guy who is gonna come to the microphone next, um, Brian McLaren. 
Oh, thanks a lot, Diana. Well, as you know, the feeling there is mutual. Uh, one of these times we're both going to uh, call each other when we're both feeling really down in the dumps, and I don't know what we'll do then, but, uh, but it's great to be uh, with you all. Uh, um, Diana, those uh, numbers and that kind of update on, on the, where things are, uh, they just tell me how important the folks on this call are. Um, committed mainline Protestant Christians in Wisconsin, everyone knows Wisconsin as a swing state has a lot of political clout and what happens there has a big effect on everybody. I live in Florida. Um, we're, uh, you know, also one of the states that are really in play. Um, but um, I would like to share with you some things that I would hope that each of you could do in the less than three weeks now uh, before the election. Um, if, if you haven't thought about it this way, there are three Sundays left uh, before the election. And uh, I don't know how many of you are gathering in person, how many of you are gathering online, or some mix of the two. But if you want to think of it in those ways, um, what can and should happen in your congregations in the next three weeks at a very, very critical time? Uh, and I just want to preface this by saying, um, some of you may know that I ended up being part of the uh, clergy uh, counter messaging uh, in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, and it had a profound effect on me to wa watch people walking down the streets of an American city with Nazi flags and Confederate flags chanting Nazi slogans. I never thought that's something I would see in my lifetime. Uh, just uh, 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 over a week ago, I was part of a rally here in southwest Florida where I live. Um, our little rally was surrounded by about 75 proud boys who were shouting obscenities and honking their horns and um, flashing white power uh, signs and, uh, and doing everything they could to intimidate. Um, and so I sense that we're in a dangerous time and people like you have a really, really important role to play. So I'd like to just share a couple of things in these three Sundays between now and the election first. And then I'd like to talk to you about some things that I also think you can be doing to prepare us for after the election, whatever happens. Um, first, uh, in these three Sundays, if you haven't done so already, if you're a pastor, um, or if you are a Sunday school or small group leader, um, this, if you haven't done it already, I hope you have, but if you haven't, now is the time to preach a sermon on a theology of democracy or a theology of voting or a theology of politics. Um, you know, a, a lot of pastors are, are, are I, I hope, are, all pastors, I hope, are being careful about the lines for 501c3 organizations. But I hope you understand, um, you are given permission to do a lot, uh, and you're only restricted from doing one thing, which is electioneering, meaning you can't name a party or name a candidate. But the values that you as a, a, a Christian leader feel uh, are right and appropriate to guide your flock as they consider exercising their power um, through voting. Uh, that's not only uh, permitted, that's, I would say, your God-given responsibility. Um, if you need some help with this, um, I'll paste this as soon as I'm done. I'll, I'll paste in a, a link. But uh, I've been doing some work this uh, year with an organization called Vote Common Good. And I prepared three uh, short sermons, a theology of democracy, a theology of voting, and a theology of politics, complete with a scripture reading and all the rest. And if you want to borrow one, you're welcome. If you want to get some ideas for something, you're welcome. But the idea is, I hope your congregation will do that. And if your congregation doesn't, um, then, you know, I hope all of you have a Facebook page or whatever. I hope you will give some thoughts on that and get word out so that Christians will bring to bear the resources of the gospel and the resources of our, our rich Christian heritage to help people have a moral sense of what voting entails. Um, because you know that if the Christian community, if the mainline Protestant community 
doesn't offer that kind of guidance, there are other people offering it. And your people, you can't blame them if they haven't, if they follow what they hear uh, elsewhere. Second, I would say each Sunday between now and then, I encourage you to pray. Make, make the election part of your prayer. Make, uh, pray against voter suppression, <laughs> um, a real danger that we face. Pray against racism. Pray against religious bigotry. Um, pray for uh, the results of the election to stand. Um, and then pray for peace and reconciliation uh, in the days and weeks after the election. Um, when we end our time, I'm going to offer you a, a benediction um, that might give you ideas of the kind of thing that you, could, uh, that you could use in your church services these next few weeks and the weeks after the election. And I'll put a link, um, it's derived from some, another project I was involved with. I'll put a link also in the chat if that would be useful. Next, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, just Google the, terms vote, the term voter suppression. Um, uh, if you are a committed Christian who cares about democracy, you need to understand voter suppression voter intimidation, voter frustration. Uh, and you may feel there are some things you can do to help oppose uh, and, and uh, uh, stop voter suppression and voter intimidation. Um, uh, and one of the things I'd encourage you to do, I'd encourage you to ask all of your members if they see anyone tampering with the election or practicing voter suppression, um, there's a number called, uh, it's 866-OUR-VOTE, 866-O-U-R-V-O-T-E. And I would tell you, I would encourage you to encourage your members, if they see something, stay where they are, stay at the poll, uh, uh, stay at the polling place and call that number. Um, because if democracy is going to stand, it's going to take all of us uh, doing our part. Um, uh, I, uh, Diana was talking a lot about white mainline Protestants, and, and I think that makes sense because, uh, uh, because of the demographics of Wisconsin and the demographics of mainline Protestantism. But I think we also need to say that uh, white people are really the problem these days. <laughs> In other words, uh, white people are making horrible threats. Uh, against, uh, against uh, people of color and white Christians are scaring Jews and scaring Muslims. And there, if you aren't aware of this, uh, you need to be aware of it. And it's one of the things that I'd also encourage you to do as, as a committed Christian to say, um, especially if you're white and Christian and especially if you're white Christian and straight to realize that this election is making a lot of people feel existential danger about their safety, uh, existential threat to their future. And um, I would encourage you to reach out to friends and just, uh, and, and, uh, and just let folks know, hey, I'm, I'm worried about what's going on. And I just want you to know if there's anything I can do to be of help and support in, in this time, please let me do it and, and let's work together um, for a, a better future. Um, and then the only other thing I'll say is it, uh, if your congregation hasn't done it already, it's not too late. Um, what if you were to say, let's aim for 100% uh, 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 voting uh, between now and Election Day? Um, and that would involve doing some organizing. And churches are really good at this sort of thing, saying if any older folks need a ride to a polling place, um, uh, or need help, uh, uh, you know, voting early in, in whatever way is appropriate for them. Um, uh, you know, churches are great at organizing that sort of thing. And that's well within your 501c3, uh, uh, what's, what's permitted. But I, can I also make another suggestion? Um, there might be younger people in your congregation. And, you know, voter turnout among uh, people under the age of 35 has really been depressing. And a lot of us hope we keep hoping in election after election that it's really going to change. This could be the election that changes, but this could be something your, your churches could do to encourage uh, young people um, to vote. Now, let me say one uh, or two other things about preparing for after, uh, after the election. None of us know what's going to happen. 
um, on, on November 3rd. Things could go very peacefully. We, uh, I, we, could, we could be so happy with how peacefully things went um, after uh, on November 3rd. But I, I don't want to scare anybody, but I think we ought to at least mentally prepare ourselves. Terrible things could happen on election day of many different kinds. And so I would encourage you, know, you as Christian uh, leaders and as committed Christians to be praying and to be preparing yourself and to be realistic and to, in a sense, you know, arm yourself uh, with, with the, the, uh, uh, the uh, how does it say it in Ephesians 6, the, uh, the uh, armor of God. In other words, prepare yourself for difficulty. And I'm not talking about anything with weapons. I'm talking about prayer and faith and, and to, to prepare yourself inside uh, for terrible things that could happen because this is the real world and terrible things happen, but also praying for uh, good outcomes. Um, and part of preparing for what happens after the election, I think would be to say in these next three Sundays, uh, if your congregation is one of those congregations that Diana mentioned, where you'll have people voting for both different candidates, I, I might even do something akin to an altar call where you ask, can I count on every one of you to support the dignity and safety of people who are voting for the other candidate? Are you, are you willing to, to commit in this congregation that you're going to be an agent of peace? Because look, we know that there are an awful lot of people who are being recruited for violence. I saw, I, I've seen it up front, uh, up close. There are people being recruited for violence. There are people being recruited for this. And especially among white communities, we've got to acknowledge there is something going on behind the scenes. And you, I would encourage you to speak to your people and say, we are Christians in this congregation. And we put our commitment to the common good uh, above any of this foolishness and wrongdoing um, that's, uh, that's happening. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say is this. Uh, if, if you're interested uh, on my blog, I, I have some resources about authoritarianism. But one of the things that's happening here in America, and it's happening around the world, uh, is a rise in authoritarianism. Um, and if you need a definition of authoritarianism, uh, you'll find it in, uh, on some of my resources on my blog. But basically, authoritarianism involves consolidating power in an individual, a party, or a cabal. Um, and, and this consolidation of power takes place uh, through the identification of real or imagined enemies who are posed as a threat. It happens through mass disinformation so that people don't know who to trust and then they will just trust the authoritarian leader. And it happens through dividing the, the nation based on loyalty to this authoritarian leader. Authoritarianism is happening in countries around the world. It's, there's a resurgence of it. And there are any number of reasons we could talk about uh, why that's happening. But here's the thing I wanna say. Something was wrong with our churches to allow this kind of authoritarianism to have such a rise. Uh, and, and here's what I'd like to say. If we want this to be healed, our churches are going to have to take the lead. And that involves doing things like teaching critical thinking. The, the biblical word for it is wisdom and understanding. <laughs> and the book of Proverbs is just full of invitations to critical thinking, wisdom and understanding. And, and our churches need to take the role, uh, take, take the lead in this again. Uh, last, you know, as Diana shared, you shared those numbers, I think a lot of mainline Protestants have felt sort of on the defensive for a long time. And, um, but I hope what we can start to feel now is this is not the time to be on the defensive. This is not the time to surrender to a narrative of decline. This is the time to say our country needs us, our world needs us, we have got to let our little light shine. And uh, our light is needed in this world. And the work of our congregations is needed. Wisconsin needs your churches to shine their light brighter and stronger than ever before. 
uh, if we're going to get through this rough patch in our history. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a couple minutes to chat. Just last week, I preached on the Philippians passage from Paul, um, whatever is, is, is truthful, whatever is lovely, whatever, you know, that beautiful list of virtues that Paul gives in Philippians uh, 4. And my sermon was really kind of simple. I went through and I just looked at each one of those six amazing words and did a Greek analysis of them. And I think the one that struck me the most, given our context right now, is that word that Paul uses when he says, whatever is, whatever is true. You know, this is what I want you to ponder and practice, whatever is true. And that word in Greek actually means whatever is factual. And I was, I mean, that kind of, that, that kind of uh, went right to the heart because of central virtue of Christian faithfulness is telling the truth, what is factually true. And so uh, all week I've been sort of, um, meditating on the relationship between being people of the word and people who have a virtue, a central virtue of truthfulness, of being people of fact. And, and so like Brian, uh, this has just given me a, a renewed passion uh, for churches to be places where the words preached and the teaching in our churches comes up against propaganda of all sorts and reminds people of things as simple as critical thinking uh is, is sort of a, how we engage history and the factualness of history and um even you know that's one of the reasons i love talking about data i mean even putting you know data facts in front of people and saying these things are truthful here are the facts now, we don't all have to agree with the policies that we do with those facts, and we can have arguments about those. But we have to figure out somehow as a society to, how we're going to return or even find maybe for the first time a new language of, of word and truth and really make that part of our identity as we're moving ahead after these incredibly hard years we've we've just been through you know that just that simple idea that we we teach people if you're a christian you love the truth and and there are so many you think of all the verses in proverbs about seeking wisdom seeking understanding seeking knowledge which means an accurate understanding of the facts right um but then you think of all the places in the new testament that warn people Beware of false teachers. Don't be deceived. Uh, many deceivers have gone out. So this sense, this is nothing new, but somehow we, I think we took so much for granted. And, 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 but regardless of what's happened in the past, uh, right now we just realize these are things where our voices are needed that we, we preach about and we, uh, we pray about and we, uh, uh, yeah, and we, and we, we challenge people. Um, I think the work of peacemaking uh, is, is, is not going to be easy because, you know, there's this sort of, I, I don't know if there's a Wisconsin version of Minnesota nice, but, you know, this idea where the, the way we get along is we just make sure to never say anything substantial enough that it would offend anybody. <laughs> yeah. um, and and that, that's part of what, what gets us into trouble. But I think what we're going to have to do, and, and, can I say to the pastors uh, who are listening, you, you can have a special role in this. You can tell people, it is my job to teach us to love one another. And that means if you're a Republican and you call yourself a Christian, you have to learn how to love your Democratic neighbor. And if you're a Democrat, you have to learn how to love your Republican neighbor. And if you're independent, you got to learn how to love every uh, love both sides, right? And, and, and you know, we can do this with humor, we can, but we have to do it. Um, and we have to help people understand this is when our faith is so needed. The love that we always talk about and sing about and all the rest, now it becomes a, a, a matter of survival, right? It's, it's, it's such an important matter. And, and instead of us feeling like, oh man, things are so bad, we could say, wow, everything we talk about really, really matters. <laughs> We're, this, this work is important.
You know, Brian, I, I sometimes uh, stop and think that in the last four years, I have depended upon uh, reading scripture and loving it more than I think that I have in the two or so decades before that. It's meant more to me. It pops every day. I turn on the news and uh, there I saw just sort of out of the corner of my eye, something come in from uh, someone from the lacrosse area synod. Uh, and, and that person said, this is important, but my blood pressure is not finding any rest or hope. And, you know, I think sometimes my blood pressure goes up, of course, when I think of myself as a leader and how much work there is to do, because even though I'm not a pastor, you know, public voice, writer, all the things that I do in the media and all kinds of other places too. And I think, oh my gosh, I've got to get out there and I've got to change this. We, I think one of the things that I've really discovered, especially in this last year, is that the primary place where I need to be recommitted, uh, where, tr where I need to understand what truth is and what wisdom is and what knowledge is, is in me. And so, so that is an, has been an interesting shift is that, yes, I have this public responsibility and yes, I have to do all this stuff. And yes, I do have this response, you know, sort of, we live in this moment of increasing authoritarianism and what are we going to do about it? And where's the church fit? But then I just sort of sit and I meditate and I pray and I say, okay, what is my responsibility to what is true? And where am I contributing to falsehood and really holding myself responsible for that? And th there might be people here who follow, I'm sure both of us on Twitter. Um, if you go back and look at my, my Twitter over the course of, I would say the last 18 months, I hope that you see what I have been trying to do. And that is I have literally moved from outrage culture and, um, any participation that I had in putting out propaganda that would have come from far left sources and putting out only things, um, retweeting only things that are truthful and factual and come from reputable sources with real information that people need in order to understand how to live their lives. And I have worked very hard uh, in my own personal voice to lower the temperature. Um, and that is, we can be truthful and we can stand for justice and we can call evil, evil, but um, we also can do that in such a way that doesn't demean the dignity of other people, that sticks to these principles of truthfulness and um, being a person of the word and love and peaceableness without, and so we, I think, you know, I'm sure Brian, you probably, have run into this too, is people say, well, I can't be peaceable right now, or, you know, um, I'm not going to do the, I can't be kind or civil, um, because that's a cop out. And I'm not talking about that. You know, I'm not talking about Hallmark greeting card kinds of nice emotions here. The Bible really teaches, the New Testament really teaches that these virtues of goodness run hand in hand with the life of the proclamation of justice for the poor, and that they are the same life. And, and I'm trying to figure out how to model that in the public square. And it's been an incredible spiritual journey for me as a person. And I've found that that has actually lowered my blood pressure when I walk my talk. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's well said. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that, um, you know, this, when you take COVID and then you take the economic impacts and then you take the political tension uh this might be the hardest patch in many of our lives or the hardest patch in this half of our lives you know and of course we would be stressed of course this would be difficult and of course all of our techniques of coping would not be sufficient for this because we've never had to develop uh, strengths and, and practices of, of coping. And so another way to look at this is to say, wow, this is a time where we need, we're going to actually need to grow in our faith and grow in our spiritual disciplines. We're going to have to go deeper in prayer. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to have heart to hearts with each other in deeper levels where as Diana, you and I often do, where we'll be on the phone and one or the others will say, 
yeah, I'm tired of being loving. I'm just mad right now. And we, we sort of talk each other off the ledge and help each other process uh, that. We've got to provide that kind of help uh, for each other. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a great opportunity. I mean, you know, a, a lot of times I just feel I wish this weren't happening. And, and other times I think I'm so glad I get to be alive and, and learn what I need to learn and do what I need to do and, and grow as I need to grow to, to be up to these times. It matters so much to be alive right now. I mean, it's, um, you know, I've spent a lifetime studying history and the truth of it is, is we're all making it right now. Yes. Every one of us. Yes. And I do want to encourage people to, you know, this, this, this notion of, of we really are the place where this all begins, I, I think is, is, is very significant. So, you know, take care of yourself, do these things and, and pay attention to your own heart and have a friend, you know, to be able to vent with and all that kind of stuff and know that this is a crazy, insane time. But if you're thinking ahead, like a two election day, and Brian was talking about some of these things uh, and you don't have a lot of bandwidth I'm, I'm really encouraging people even to do simple things that would contribute to the peaceableness of the environment for which, in which you find yourself. And um, I, I had been thinking about, oh, you know, we've got to organize here and do this kind of thing over here. And um, one of the things that my friend does know here, uh, Brian knows that Diana can't organize her closet you know, much less a movement. <laughs> so my refrigerator is a mess. So, so it's like, I, I always have to think of what is the simple thing that's right in front of me that can create a better world without, you know, being overly complex and stressing myself. So I was on, I was on the phone with a, a Episcopal priest in Florida, um, North Florida, Brian, so a little ways away from where you are. And he was telling me that his congregation, which is about a 70% Biden, a 30% Trump congregation, they're committed to creating a peaceable day at the voting booth um, near, which it, there's, I guess there's a polling station right down the street from them. And one simple thing they're doing is they're playing their carol on all day on election day. Mm. And they're simply filling the air with familiar hymns, uh, patriotic songs, lovely pieces of, of, of music. And they all could agree on that. They all came together and said, yes, let's, let's do that. And so, um, you know, that's such a simple thing, music, yeah. you know, and they're not, and they, they know together that, that music can, take the heart to a different place. And so, so if you can, if you're too stressed to think of the big thing, or if you're not organized like me, um, think of those simple things. And there are lots of creative little things um, that I think congregations can do that wind up having a much bigger and more beautiful impact than, uh, you know, I mean, that's what faith to me is often about is you do some little thing and it winds up being some huge, beautiful thing that's very close to the heart of God. So, um, so I, I, if you're stressed, maybe concentrate on those things and, and you can really change a lot with some small steps. That's, that's right. Um, uh, Carrie, I don't know if you want to bring any questions to the table for, that folks are raising. Uh, there is a technical question from someone. A uh, reminder that Wisconsin has a lot of Missouri and Wisconsin Synod Lutherans and Diana, they'd like to know, are they usually counted as mainline um, or something else? Uh, they're usually counted as evangelicals. So the, in terms of the sociological grouping, they would be in the white evangelical family. Sometimes people bring up also the, the other question, like the UCC, I guess, has a lot of um, uh, congregations that are pretty well integrated. And so they often ask me, well, where does a black UCC or fit? And um, I put in the chat, uh, black Protestants, both evangelical mainline and just black Protestants, because they don't fit in those white categories of evangelical and mainline very easily. Black Protestants have their own category 
So if you're, say, in a UCC church that has, um, you know, 50% black and 50% white, uh, your white people are counted as white mainliners and your black members are counted as black Protestants sociologically. So thanks for the technical question. I actually know the answer to some of these things. <laughs> Then we have a, a, a deeper philosophical question asking you to muse on truth. <laughs> um, facts and data as opposed to religious experience. Um, and so you know, how do we know what is true? What do we point to those sorts of things um, in a time when truth is so deeply contested? Wow, that's a great question. And I mean, that's, that's a book. Um, but um, the thing that's sort of interesting, I think about both the projects that Brian and I are working on, that his book coming out in January and mine coming out in um, March, are both books that are deeply experiential. Um, we actually both both were working separately. We didn't realize it until about six or eight months ago, I think, um, separately on the same kind of subject is the role of experience and as as a truthful interpreter of uh, who Jesus is, in my case, the book I'm writing, and in Brian's case, in what theology is more broadly. And so we both, I, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for for Brian, put words in his mouth. Usually, <laughs> usually it's the other way around. The guy's putting the words in the woman's mouth. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but um, you know, we both, and this part of our friendship, I think, um, have an incredibly strong role for experience in our understanding of what Christian truthfulness is. Um, but for myself, I actually see all of those aspects that the questioner brought up as all part of the same thing. I mean, um, as a person who is an academic, as a person who has been a college professor, as a person who loves um, studying and you know, philosophy and all the things I love, um, I think that the facts and, and history and real data and trying to understand the nature of the is science, trying to understand the nature of the universe as the universe is as close as we can in our feeble understandings um, and wisdom and experience that that is the whole journey of what truth is and in our culture we cut off bits of that and we put them in different categories and we let those different bits go to war at one another but it's my my heart's contention that the life of a of mature Christian knowing is the integrate the full integration of all of those things, and I think that the church has a role to play in how that's modeled and taught. Well said. Uh, yeah, I don't know how philosophical we want to get, but I'll just throw out a little nugget that someone uh, passed on to me a while back. Um, you know, the the philosophical word for how we know what true what is true is called epistemology. And um, one of our struggles is that uh, many of us, uh, we, we learn about truth in what we might call an epistemology of dominance. How can I control something? To, like the, the clearest example is you might remember being in biology class and the way you got to know what's true about a frog was to dissect it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you take control over it, you take it apart. Um, you dominate it. Um, but then you might remember uh, Jane Goodall, when she went on, un, wanted to understand chimpanzees, it's not to say there's no time for dissection, but she went out into the Tanzanian forest and just sat at the base of the tree and watched the chimpanzees and, and observed them. So instead of controlling them, she took interest in them and developed a curiosity she wanted to know what was true about them and it required her being in a relationship with, with them where they presented themselves to her. Uh, and uh, someone said, that's not an epistemology of domination, that's an epistemology of love, that you know something by loving it. And again, this is where our, our politics, every four years we engage in this ritual of attempted domination. Everything's about winning. 
And so you don't want to know what's true about the other party. You want to know intelligence so you can defeat them. And, um, and so this is where, again, our spiritual work of calling people. Remember the, the, the phrase from the New Testament, let everything you do be done in love. Well, that includes your knowing and your understanding and your politicking. Uh, so uh, this is where, again, our faith is so important. It's so needed at this time. The resources of our faith are so needed. And, and the benefits not only come to us who are Christians, but because Christians still make up the largest percentage of the population when you put them all together, um, if we don't have that love, everybody else suffers. And if we are promoting that love, everyone benefits. I know the two of you have some closing remarks for us, but I did just want to share a, a final note from one of our participants who says, it seems to me that you're saying the gospel today is revealed to the world when a group of people who are divided on their affiliation still choose to gather together in agreement that Jesus is Lord. I go with that. <laughs> yeah, amen. 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 Yeah, and you know, I, I dare to believe, like for me, the test case uh, as, as a you know, white male Christian in the 21st century is I say, knowing what we know now, what do I wish churches would have been doing in the 1850s and the 1840s, all the way back to 1619. Um, and, and I don't wish that Christians had just said, let's never talk about slavery because that's divisive. Let's never talk about race because we disagree. I wish that Christians had said, we love the truth and we love our neighbors and we are going to grapple with this issue um, and uh, let the chips fall where they may. We are going to grapple with this issue. And the people who disagree with this, we're going to love them. We're never going to stop loving them, but we're going to grapple with this. And, and that spirit to say, we're going to work this out because we are Christians and we believe in love and we're going to work this out. Um, and, and this is where, uh, again, the, the call to discipleship uh, challenges uh, our, our political indoctrinations. And, and so I, I think we, we have to lift that up. Yeah. I think about the, that comment too, is that it is, it's so much more than just saying, you know, that Jesus is Lord. It's actually living into yeah. the, the, that alternative Lordship of Jesus. And I was, um, I just uh, was writing a whole a section of, of, of my manuscript and it was about this issue of what is the Lord, what is the Lordship? Um, not a sort of a domineering Jesus as Caesar vision, uh, but instead I drew out of Julian of Norwich and her vision of Jesus as our kind Lord. And the word kind is also the, the same word from which we get kin. And so the Lordship of, of Jesus is, and even as Paul says in Philippians, is an essential kind of gentleness, um, a kindness that goes beyond um, what we think of as, as regular, you know, sort of niceness, uh, but that it binds us, the word kind and kin being related to one another, it binds us into a new kinship with God and one another. And so I have really been praying through these, uh, th these ideas in recent weeks about, the, about Jesus' Lordship being one of essential kindness that is related to our kinship with one another and with the earth. And so that's a different vision than we usually hear put forth in our churches, but I think it is the one that the world is most crying out to hear and see us practice right now. So as Paul, as Paul said in Philippians, ponder and practice. Don't just say or think about, but ponder and practice. So that's what I'm trying to imagine um, for the church that, of the, that is being born right now. I think a new church is being born right now. Um, well, did you want me to tell my story, Brian? 
in closing? Yeah, and, and you know, we just have, I think, two or three minutes. So we'll probably, uh, I'll, I'll shorten what I was going to do and you can uh, go ahead and tell that story. Yeah, I just wanted to um, give folks a sense of one of the places where I found hope this week. Um, every Wednesday, my neighborhood has a farmer's market and uh, I was just there uh, yesterday. And at the farmer's market, there's actually uh, two political booths right at the exit of the market, one for Democrats and one for the Republicans. And over these low many months and years that the Democrats and the Republicans have shown up at the farmer's market, I've gotten to know um, the people who work the booth of my own political party. And so I know that the, the women who work the Democratic booth are some of my dearest um, friends uh, in my neighborhood. And so I stopped by the booth uh, yesterday and was chatting with them. And while I was talking with them, and there were two friends who are Catholics and myself who is an Episcopalian and another friend who works the booth and she is an Episcopalian, we're all white. And so we're behind the, the table at this booth and up walks uh, some people who wanted some literature. And uh, this Latino man walked up and he wanted a, a, a Biden sticker and this uh, two black women came up and they just wanted to talk and we were talking and they took some, they wanted some signs. And then this, uh, a Muslim family walked up and at first it was the two men, the father and a son. And there was a, a Muslim woman who was hanging back just a little bit and she was wearing all the black robes and the hijab. And so, but she, she, she was very clearly wanting to come close to the booth. And so we were prompting her, pulling her forward. And as she came up to the booth, uh, she told us our, as best we could understand in her broken English. She was probably about my age, somewhere between 50 and 60. And, and she communicated to us that it was the first time she was ever voting in an election. And she was so excited to vote. And she was looking at all of the buttons and she was wanted a button for her, her hijab. And, and so we were having the best time as Spanish and some, you know, Middle Eastern language that we weren't quite sure what, the, what this family spoke. And uh, the Christians and the, is, who were Catholic and Protestant and then the, 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 the Muslims and the, the two black women who who were Baptists and we were just having a great time and I looked over and the table next to us and this is not saying you know Democrats are good and Republicans are bad but this is a contrast story um, I looked over and the Republican booth was all white men except for one woman who was behind the table she was working the table and there were about six white guys who were standing at the at the booth and they were talking about about Trump and doing literature and the same things we were doing. And at that moment, when I saw these two booths, these two tables so close to one another, I sort of stepped out of my own experience for a minute. This is all, writers do this all the time. And I sort of observed the moment. And I realized that I had spent so much of my younger life wanting to be around tables of people who were just like me. And I looked over to that Republican table where everybody looked exactly alike. And I thought about how much energy I had put into my early life, wanting to set a table where I felt safe and where there were no stories that would particularly challenge the way that I understood the world. And then I looked at the table where I was standing and I would have been terrified by that table um, years ago. And yet here I was standing at that table with all of that diversity and laughter and joy. And really, I, I felt this really strange sense of identification with this Muslim woman who was about my age. And I felt so much joy at her being a first time voter. And when she put the button on her robe and the, the, the pride of citizenship and her religious tradition and everything was just it was glowing on what I could see of her face. And I was so happy to be at this other kind of table. And I thought, well, isn't that really kind of what we're arguing about? You know, it's, it's not just about politics, but we're really having an argument right now in America about what kind of table. And um, we have a lot to say about that as Christians. What kind of table? Who comes up and who joins in the laughter? So I just want to leave you with that story. I walked away. It felt amazing. 
to have been there and to have seen the two tables and realize the transformation in my own life and realize how we really can create a different kind of, of, of American table. And that it's going to be so much more than just two booths of po political partisans at a farmer's market. It's going to be really the table that God has imagined, the feast of God uh, for all. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, again to Carrie and to all of you who've, uh, who've been part of this. Uh, I, I would like to just share this, uh, this benediction. Um, I'm sharing a shorter version of a benediction that uh, I was honored to be part of creating with uh, some rabbis and imams and uh, Sikhs and Buddhists and theists and non-theists, but we said we want to offer a blessing to uh, our nation uh, about voting. And so I'd just like to share that with you right now. May you vote. May you vote as a member of the beloved community that Dr. King envisioned, an inclusive society based on justice, equal opportunity, and love for all human beings, no exceptions. May you vote with black mothers and fathers in mind who worry every time their sons go out to play so that they will worry no more. May your vote bring us to the day when young and old, every single life, a black life matters. May you cast a vote for all God's children near and far, but especially those who remain locked in cages or wrapped in foil blankets, crying for their parents. And may you vote with those parents in mind, still desperate to find the child taken from their arms by our government. May you vote with an embrace of the orphan, widow, and stranger. May, you vote, may your vote offer compassion for those grieving the death of family members in this pandemic and for those whose grief is yet to come. May your vote offer strength to healthcare workers heroically struggling on the traumatic front lines of this pandemic, too many still without the help they need. May your vote, may you vote for the freedom of religion for religious minorities, the American Muslim community who suffered the very, uh, who, who has suffered so much for Jews who face a resurgence of anti-Semitism around the world, for the sick who suffer violence simply because they wear a turban. May your vote, uh, may your vote strengthen safety and well-being and welcome for all. May you vote in support of the LGBTQ community that continues to suffer policies and prejudices that threaten their personal safety and workplace security. May you vote so that the air we breathe and the water we drink are protected, clean and safe. May you vote for forests and streams and meadows and oceans that need to be protected from human greed and recklessness that's threatening the health of our climate and the future of our earth. May you cast your vote for a moral budget and for an ethical economy so that every table has on it enough food for all and so that no child goes hungry and so that no one will ever again need to choose between food and medicine. May you cast a vote for peaceful protest. May your vote support the teenagers, the athletes, the moms on the front lines protesting violence against America's black and brown men, women and children. May your vote bring an end to state-inspired and sanctioned violence and blood on our streets. May you vote against cult, king, and authoritarian regime. With your vote, may your vote bring a peaceful transition, transfer of power. May we the people help shape this most important election in our lifetime by exercising our precious right to vote. May our votes bend the arc of history toward justice, joy, and peace for all God's children and all God's creatures, no exceptions. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to both of you, Diana and Brian, for your time and your care and your faithfulness. Thank you for all that you bring to the ecumenical community, to people of faith around the country, and 
the hope you've brought to us tonight, as well as the challenge. Um, to all of you on this call, many blessings in your ministries and go forth and get some rest for the work that is ahead of us and the people in your care. Take care. Peace. Peace.